Good morning, good morning for some of the, you, my friends, and good evening for my friends in Asia. We are just waiting for Prince Dimitri to join us. And we will start. Thank you, my friends, for logging in. Hi, everyone. Hi, Brandy. Hi, Steven. Good morning. Hi, Joe. Hi, Liz. Here you go. Good morning, all. Good morning, Prince. Good morning, Prince Dimitri. How are you? Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. How are you, Prince Dimitri? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, fine, and you? I'm very good. good. To Thank you. you. Good to see you too. You have a good connection. You have a good light. Did you have a good night's sleep? Sort of. <laughs> I had a book sort signing of. last night, and we ended up. Oh, I it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we'll talk a little bit about your book tonight as well. But let me first welcome you properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to say a few words to all our listeners and to all our friends who are joining in right now. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, it is my absolute honor and privilege to welcome Prince Dimitri of Yugoslavia in our chat today. Uh, a few words uh, before we move into the questions. After a long uh, position as a senior vice president of jewelry in Sotheby's and later on a head of jewelry at Philips uh, auction house, Prince Dimitri started his own jewelry company called Prince Dimitri Jewelry. And uh, he written a book just now, just quite recently that we will talk about a little bit as well. And welcome Prince Dimitri. Your um, you are a fountain of information. It was actually very difficult for me to come up with a number of questions because there is so much I would like to ask you and I would like our listeners to, to hear, but I will try. You are absolutely agile to chat graciously about so many subjects, about books, about history, about art, about style, about uh, anything, basically. You speak multiple languages and yet you are so down to earth. You are related to most of the royal houses, royal families in Europe. And just to name a few, I have to even look a little bit just to, to at least not to make a mistake, although it's not possible because you are really related to most of them, uh, including the King Louis the Ninth and uh, Catherine the Medici and Louis the Fourteenth and Louis the Fifteenth and Mary, Queen of Scots, and Catherine the Great on your father's side, and Nicholas the First and Alexander the Second, among so many others. Um, tell us about your favorite, perhaps maybe you can tell us a little bit about your ancestry and what uh, influences did you have from them? And maybe you can share with us a short, your favorite uh, story about your family story. Well, there's lots of ancestors I have, which were kind of, uh, had interesting stories. I've always loved um, <clears throat> history very, very much. And uh, there's a few uh, that I like uh, a lot. Is one is Catherine of Medici, the other one is Louis XIV, and the other one is uh, Catherine the Great. Okay. All of them for different reasons, of course. Louis XIV was the, the epitome of the... Uh, uh, enlightened sovereign of the um, 17th century and 18th century also. He um, created, the, I think, the concept of uh, um, the image of the, of the monarchy. There was a very interesting event that happened once. He had, um, he had to be operated. And as you know, operations in those days were not like <laughs> today. Um, absolutely, <laughs> yes anesthesia and a nice hospital and everything. It was more like knives and uh, hot yes. red hands. The sterilization with, uh, with uh, vodka probably or with the, with the alcohol. Yes, with wine, I think. With wine, <laughs> yeah, awesome. probably. So the operation was so horrific that his body went into coma and he was in coma for quite a while, a few hours. 
So everybody at court, you know, thought that was it. He was going to die. Everybody was already paying homage to the, uh, the crown prince and all that. And all of a sudden, uh, Louis XIV woke up. And um, the doctor was there, said, you know, your majesty, we were so worried about you. We thought you were gone and all that. How do you feel? And uh, Louis XIV had a brilliant answer. He said, the man is suffering, but the king is all right. Here you go, the responsibility. The responsibility and the, the image you are, you know, your image, you, are, you owe it to your country as the king to always be all right. Even if you have your own little problems, like we all do, the king has to set an example. Exactly. That actually brings me to my next question. What is the... What is the real function of the royalty? Well, in, what, in those days, and what do you think is the real function in the com contemporary times? I think the, the, the function in contemporary times is kind of all, was always the same. I always say that um, royals are not celebrities. They are role models. And, they're, and they're paid for that. Let's not forget that. Uh, is to be a role model, to, give the Im to be the image of the country, so that all the citizens of the country can be proud. Um, from a psychological point of view, you can also say that the king and the queen are the father and mother figure of the nation, you know, to whom people can look up and uh, be proud of and admire them. Absolutely. Uh, the best example for that is uh, uh, the Queen of England today. And I mean, I would say the same of all the other sovereigns uh, um, still uh, in power today. They do a fantastic job and they make their country proud. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. They're real McCoys, they're not celebrities, in a sense. Yeah, they're, and yeah, they're in, yeah. Exactly, and uh, a little bit about uh, the members of your family. And I know that several members of your family during the World War II really helped a lot to survive for, for certain individuals and to escape actually Europe. And perhaps you can tell me, tell all of us a little bit about this, your mother who helped uh, the orphans during the World War II. And this is what uh, I, you told me and what I know about. Yeah. Yes, and the stories in my book, uh, along with the photos of her, she was 12 years old then. And um, my grandparents uh, had told her that there were many, many uh, orphans uh, uh, of the war, little children, and they were all mutilated. Uh, they had suffered through the bombings and things like that. And, um, my mother said yes, and she, she went with her parents to the orphanage. And um, that day, there were 40 of them that had been uh, found in the streets and were basically starving and had nothing to wear and everything. And she brought, I mean, they brought them back to the palace. They were living in the Quirinale Palace in Rome, which, okay. it's, which is still there. It's where the president lives today. The Quirinale Palace, so you have an idea, which is in the center. It's a beautiful of palace. Yes. Okay. Importantly, it's two and a half times the size of Versailles. So, really? it's about, yeah, it's about three times the size of Buckingham Palace. Because it's unbelievable. Yeah, so she looked after them the whole time. And then uh, uh, um, it was unbelievable. And the first time my mother told me that when she went to the orphanage and she saw these poor children, somebody, some of them with a cut arm, some with a cut uh, uh, leg, some of them were blind and stuff like that. She almost fainted. fainted. It was such a shock. Of course. But then she, you know, she brought them back and she adored them. They were like her own children. Even though she was 12, she felt the responsibility. And it was, an, and I, you have to read the story in my book because there's, there's what I can't say on TV because I'm going to start yes. crying. <laughs> of course. I know how you feel totally. Yeah, it's, 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 it's an exactly. incredible, what a noble woman, your mother. Yeah, but my grandmother was yes. the same, you know, she... Yes actively worked with the Pope, and she uh, uh, hid uh, Jewish families during the war. And um, I found out when I was 19 years old, and I was in Geneva, I went to say hello, I went to have lunch with her actually. And it was in November, and I saw a pile of letters, but I've never seen so many letters on two tables, like there must have been a thousand of them. And I asked her what, who, who was writing so much to her. And she said, oh, yes, those are the, the families uh, um, of the people I saved during the war. And I said, well, tell me about it. 
Yes, and she said, well, there was all this persecution going on, and she had uh, contacts with the Pope, with the monasteries and the convents all over Italy, and they were all, you know, actively organizing to, to hide Jews in those places. Unbelievable. Yeah, so she had... Bless them. And when they went on an official function, for instance, she knew that somebody was gonna, from the crowd would give her a, a little bouquet of flowers, let's say, with a red ribbon. So she knew to keep it, and that in the, that little bouquet there was a message of who to hide, where they were, etc. And then she would reciprocate by, um, you know, calling, sending a message, sending her ladies and waiting or her people. And so it was this active way of communicating. And she told me the whole story when I was there. And it My was... God, I, I have a goosebumps, and uh, yeah. you know, it's like an, it's 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 unbelievable. It, this this is the story of its own, and its book is of its own. I should say, yeah, never, yeah. never to never again, and never to forget. Never to forget. And the other one was the Queen Mother of Romania, Queen Helen of Romania. And okay. she, had, she was a, a Greek princess. She was the sister of the King of Greece. And also in Romania, same thing. She, she was so um, active and so efficient in, in saving Jewish people that she was given the highest honor by the state of Israel after the war. Which this was, is incredible. Yeah, this is incredible. And, you know, uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart on behalf of everyone yeah. for the story and to your family. It could yeah. to your I, really. know, I always say, and I always put it into perspective, right now we are all suffering with COVID, etc., etc. But I always remember my grandparents. They went through World War I, World War II, and some of them went through three uh, revolutions, like my Greek grandmother. She saw all her Russian relatives uh, died. There was also the revolution in Greece yeah. and one in Yugoslavia. And you know what? When you met her, she never, ever complained. She was always dignified, always kind, always trying to see what she could do for other people. And I can say that of my four grandparents. That's wonderful. It's resilience. It's also yeah. kindness. It's uh, it's um, class from mm. the from within, and I think it's so noble and yeah, yeah, it's just nobility. unbelievable. It, really beautiful. Thank you for telling this to us. And Thanks. I would like to touch a little bit on your education and your career. It's fascinating and incredible. And just maybe you can tell us a little bit about it. And uh, just what is more fun to be a lawyer or to be a jeweler? I think it's more fun to be a, a <laughs> jeweler. But, it's just, uh, I knew you were going to say that, of course. But it's very useful to be a lawyer. I learned a lot of things in law school that still help me today. Mm. I'm very I, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, especially, yes, in this world and being yeah. in business and looking out for yourself, for the contracts and all, of course. And so where did the fascination with the jewelry come from? <laughs> I was born like that, I think. I, mean, I remember as a child, I was fascinated by stones, by gems, by anything that moved. And I, I, I say it in the intro, I wrote it in the introduction of my own book. I always thought that jewels created a halo of light, an aura of glamour around uh, she who wears it. And it was a gift of beauty that made that. Um, made the she who wears the jewelry sort of above the rest of us common mortals and um, it was yes. witnessing a form of magic as a child that's how i saw it yeah and so now when i design my jewelry i always try to recreate the, the this glamour and this thing that will make the woman who wears it mysterious special. beautiful uh, uh, like yeah special that's that's wonderful. So you definitely so you you have incredible collection of pieces that mm -hmm. inspire you, I believe, for to create your own collections. And uh, are there any particular pieces from any particular ancestors that you really treasure that uh, uh, influence your own designs? I don't think the pieces themselves influence my designs. I think it was more the feel that emanated from them, that feeling of glamour and luxury and all that. Certainly the movement is something that in influenced me. All my jewelry moves. Everything is, when it's mounted and it's soft, it dangles for the earrings and all that. But I've never looked at their jewelry as a source really of inspiration. What really inspires me 
but to begin with, is, is a stone itself if I have to mount the, sto the stone. But then it's the decorative arts, because that was the lesson I learned by reading the life of Louis Cartier. And Cartier okay. never looked at jewelry. He only looked at decorative arts. So he found uh, pieces in Egypt, and then he constructed around them. It was the famous Retour d'Egypte period of Cartier. Mm -hmm. He... He looked at the decorative arts in India and uh, in medieval times. So I've done that. I've explored, because I've always liked arts in general also. So I've explored all sorts, all the shapes and decorative elements from um, the Islamic world, from China, from Japan, from the Middle Ages a lot, from Art Deco. And I use those um, shapes to construct around them. And I also use unusual materials. I use leather, rubber, wood. Mm -hmm. To make it very contemporary, to make it, in, to bring this uh, uh, heritage into the modern days, modern yes. times, I suppose. So it has two layers. It has the modern look, but also the classic uh, um, old world elegance and glamour. Fantastic. And how, can you tell us a little bit, how do you personalize your jewelry? Uh, how do you create, how, how do you personalize your own pieces that you create? Um, you mean when I do it for somebody else? Yes, because I know a little bit about it, but I would like to hear it from you. I do mostly one-of-a-kind pieces. And um, for instance, uh, recently I did a, uh, an engagement ring. I mean, not recently, a few years ago, I did an engagement ring. And I engraved inside just you and me. Uh, I said to the husband who was giving the, the ring, I said, we have to do something a little bit special here. So I said, we could, would you like to say to engrave just you and me? And then we can engrave a little heart on the side. And in the center of the side of the heart, one tiny little brilliant cut diamond to make it very special. So I love that. really very tender, very elegant, very special and definitely very yes. unique. But also so, very clever without the names. So then, yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I gave him another idea. I said, when you, you're going to give this, uh, when you're going to ask her to marry you, and say, I want you to convince your wife not to tell every, anybody. And I want you to go on a pre-honeymoon for three days, let's say, in a place of your choice, where nobody is going to know where you are. Nobody is going to know yet that, you've, uh, that you are engaged. And it, was, it will be a, a memory that you will keep for the rest of your life and it will make it all the more romantic and stuff. And he was a bit flabbergasted. He said, I have the idea. And then after the weekend, he called me. He said, you have no idea what you did to me. <laughs> she thought I was the most romantic, uh, thoughtful man that ever existed. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, I said, well, don't say it's me. Never, never admit that it's me. You have to say it's you. And <laughs> well, I just wanted to mention that now, I believe he's going to ask you for every single step of his, uh, <laughs> before he's making any major decisions with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> really? no, that was many years ago. I mean, it was... Uh, I might do that as well, by the way. I'll ask your yeah, opinion. Yeah. It was six years ago, and I can tell you it's a very, very happy marriage. That's wonderful. So you bless them with your thoughts, with your idea, for sure. But then I gave um, other things. On the cover of my book is a big uh, branch in the shape of, um, of a paisley branch, which is typical of the decorative arts of India. Can you, since you mentioned your book right now, can you please show all of us the cover of your book? Uh, everyone, this is an incredible book that is published by Rizzoli. It's called, uh, maybe you can tell us a, a little bit about the book yourself. Uh, yourself and uh, Yeah. So on the cover, you see a paisley branch. And that's never been done before. And it's exactly what you see on fabrics in India. And so in the back of it, because I made it for somebody, I engraved also a message. I engraved all religions, arts and sciences are branches of the same tree, Einstein, because Einstein said that and we were discussing things like that. So it made it very, very personal for the person. Oh, and especially yes. all the more relevant for my book, because my great grandmother, uh, Queen Elizabeth of Belgium, saved the life of Einstein. She, she was queen then in 1934 and my grand great grandfather was the king. And they had heard from their informants that of the persecution and the terrible things going uh, on in, the, in Nazi Germany against the right. Jews. And they heard that uh, um, he was at risk of being, uh, um, you know, abducted by the Nazis, yes. and maybe killed or sent to a camp. And she invited him over. And when he was there, 
she explained the situation and she organized a boat uh, that he boarded on in Antwerp and he sailed to London. And once he was in London, he could then prove to the American authorities who were not giving him his visa for some reason. He could prove to them that he was a, a political refugee. So then he got the, the, the visa and he immigrated to America and he stayed here and the rest is history. This is, I, uh, this is yeah. absolutely unbelievable. Uh, you know, I'm going to cry in a minute just from the, from, the, <laughs> from the stories that you tell and just from the kindness of your family that uh, and brings you... out all the best qualities in, in you as well. Yeah, thank you. And there's another great aunt of mine who was a French princess. She was from the house of uh, uh, Napoleon. She was a great grandniece of Napoleon. She had married Prince George of Greece. And she was very eccentric and very smart and all that. And she was fascinated by psychology. And she became friends with Sigmund Freud. And she did all oh the God. for him, including she went into uh, the prisons and she um, interviewed uh, and interrogated uh, people who had committed murders because she wanted to understand, uh, you know, the, the, the mind of a murderer and write about it in the treaty on the, um, psychosis and neurosis. And the same thing happened there. She found out that the, the, the Nazis were about to kidnap him in, um, in Austria. And because she had so much money, because her father, her grandfather had been the real estate developer of the Principality of Monaco, and she was an only grandchild left. She had inherited all that money. She hired a plane. Um, she chartered the plane. She went to uh, Vienna, where he was, and grabbed him and ran to the airport with him and flew him uh, out and uh, saved Sigmund Freud. And psychology, I mean, he was able for the rest of the to, to develop all his theories and all that. Yeah. And otherwise, you can say that thanks to these two women, if they hadn't been there, the science of psychology today wouldn't have been so... Would have been not, of course. Same with quantum physics, because all his studies then uh, influenced uh, uh, all the the, 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 the the researches afterwards. The most yeah. two first ones right after me being uh, Riemann and Lobachevsky, who then yes, influenced... Yes, Lobachevsky, uh, of course. Right, all of that, and they, all that derived from Einstein. So it's fascinating to see yes. the unintended consequences of... Unbelievable. Of these two ladies. So sometimes, you know, in life, kindness goes a long, long way. And, and sometimes, you know, a lot of people think that kindness is a form of, uh, of weakness, but it's not. Not at all. Strength. No, no. It's it's form of strength. It's form of yes. uh, passion. Yes. And it's, it's just, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a way of life. For, I hope it would be a way of life for many people. It's yes. unbelievable, fascinating stories. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then, you know, that I, you, t you mentioned all this incredible people that, you know, I wanted to ask, what are your favorite, what, what would be, who would be your famous ancestor that you would like to meet and what era it would be. But, you know, all these names that you've mentioned, I, I kind of uh, probably answered it uh, through your story right now, through the answer of the... Yeah, there were so many of them. I mean, yes. from St. Louis, which is Louis the Ninth that you mentioned earlier, who went to the, the first crusades, to, to, to liberate the, you know, Palestine and... Yes. And, and it's where also after that, we got the, um, the Holy Shroud of Turin. You know the, you know what it is, right? The Holy Shroud yes, of Turin. Yes, 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 yes. You know that that arrived in my family in the 14th century. Unbelievable. Uh, and we owned it until uh, 1982. It stayed for more than 500 years in my family. And it was thanks to the, the Crusades who went and found that relic, along with the, the, the Crown of Spines, which is now in the um, Saint-Chapelle um, next to Notre Dame in Paris. Incredible. And I know, I, well, I, I know, I believe that uh, some of your family flew uh, Italy at that time uh, and landed to, in Portugal, I guess. It's all was kind of correlated to some of the... Um, Yes, my grandfather. Events was... that happened historically in in uh, in Italy. Yes, yes, yes. Well, the, the shroud itself never left Italy. It's always stayed in the um, in the chapel built for that in uh, in Turin, uh, next to the in the palace. Right. Mm. Incredible. Um, yeah. And uh, what is what? 
we probably move into a little bit more of a lighter uh, subjects a little bit because I, but I'm you know I I actually lost even track of some of the questions <laughs> that I wanted to ask you because I'm just so fascinated with the stories and with your uh, his, the history of the family and the and the kindness of the human beings and the, the hum, humble attitude it's really it's ex ex extraordinary but uh, nevertheless uh, i want to ask you what uh, what do you see in the jewel where is the jewelry going to we are in covid times people are dressing more casually these days uh, how do you see for example like a french cup which i personally like is it going to stay is it going to leave is does a, actually anybody is wearing the 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 cufflinks this 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 time or is it totally very very casual and jewelry is linking towards something that more of a, an accessory i think right now it's all very casual but it probably will change so you know, it goes back and forth in history i love I agree. It, but i don't i haven't worn them in a long long time a few days ago for the first time in uh, since um, january since uh, you know but it's certainly a bit more you know casual right now more simple but it will never go out of fashion because yeah. the jewelry is something very special to women and to men also absolutely yes uh, and that's like more and more jewelry i find which is good because it, they used to in the old days in renaissance times they even wore were the more than women because it was a sign of power and um, all of that yeah and actually men's i wear quite often men's cufflinks on my own shorts yeah. and i love it i think it's uh, such a, a beautiful piece and uh, and just uh, yeah. to carry and a beautiful accessory i should say and especially then the really uh, unique so i, I think, think you can dress it up, up and dress it down and, yeah. and what is your casual styling i mean i know uh, i believe that i know uh, Uh, that you like chiffonelles which i also like i actually did a beautiful event for them years ago in singapore but yeah. what is the, what do you wear as a uh, this day what is your casual style jeans and a white shirt okay but i always wear my bracelets and what are your bracelets oh okay so the the, the um, evil eye bracelets not really no. it, um, it i can't to... see that very well hold on i'm going to put it closer to the Green. You see? Okay, so oh, okay, soft. okay, beautiful. Are they? What, well, can then, you tell um, me a little bit about them? Who and are they? Are they from Sandy Precious Stones? And are they? Do they represent they're, anything in particular? Beads. No, no, no. It's just beads. It's one is an emerald. Then it, this is a sapphire and a blue topaz, like an amethyst, like a like, like Havashan. And next to my watch, I wear um, a black pearl here. You see? Okay, you have a good taste. You're wearing all the Merpigier. <laughs> yes, it's my old one. Nice. And, um, it makes it for a more casual, uh, uh, modern look, but it also um, is very wearable for a man. I think, especially with leather, it makes it more masculine. Yes, more. it's yes, it's yes, it's refined, but yet it's edgy at the same time and very modern. Yeah, yeah. People think it's glass when they see it. They don't know it's an emerald. I, yeah, I don't think so. Well, you know, maybe in these days, walking yeah. in New York, maybe it's better that they think that it's better glass. Than, oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And what are your most favorite? Do you have any particular gems that you you would like to work with? Uh, is there anything that you gravitate to in terms of the color, in terms of the all of them? All of them. I like all of them. I really okay. do. I like combinations of. Um, semi-precious and precious that I like very much I love for instance but what I'm wearing I love to mix emeralds and sapphires if I mount an aquamarine and there's quite a few examples of that in the book uh, I love to mix uh, pearls with um, with moonstones um, I love oh, to I love it yeah it goes very very well together except especially if you add some sapphires Um, I love the combination of uh, amethyst with um, uh, rubies and also with moonstones. I've done a lot of things like that. Um, you know. Beautiful. So the color combination is very important, and yet you are very adventurous in mixing uh, absolutely uh, yeah. some of the stones and the colors. I love it. Especially if uh, if you mount them on wood or steel, and you do something a bit more edgy. Yeah, you'll see. There's a lot of that in the book. 
can you tell us a little bit uh, more uh, when we can buy the book, where we can buy the book, by the way? You know, uh, as uh, we spoke to one another just a few days ago, I would like to offer the opportunity at some point later on to have an, uh, to our listeners to have another talk specifically about the book with you, because I think it's incredible and the stories and the creativity mm -hmm. and creations that you uh, explore and uh, write about, I think it will be of huge interest and uh, we all want to have your book. Yeah, yeah, no, it came out very nicely. I mean, I'm very happy with it. It's very, very big. It's 288 pages. Oh my God. Can you please tell us uh, again the title of the book and where it could be bought and where you're going oh. to sell it? So it's called Once Upon a Diamond. Diamond, yes. Uh, buy it on my website, which is uh, princedimitri.com. You okay. can buy it on Amazon, and you can buy it in different work um, uh, bookstores uh, around the world. You can buy it at Penage Books in London, at um, Galignani in Paris. And Hennage Books in London, by the way, is a marvelous shop with mostly antique and rare books. Yes, yes, yes. Art Fantastic. And they have very kindly this, uh, agreed to carry my book, even though it's not an antique. Hopefully it will be one day. Well, it, 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 it des deserves a life of uh, present. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Then there's a, there's a few Rizzoli uh, shops around the world. That, yes. Well, I have to ask uh, Rizzoli to find out. Uh, we, I'll, I'll sort it out and it will be my own and definitely I will help uh, to let our, our friends and the uh, people who are watching us uh, in Asia to get their hands on, on the book and uh, definitely we'll talk about it yeah. uh, one more time. And I also would like to mention uh, uh, another program that you've uh, given your beautiful interviews. It's a program uh, called One Way Ticket Show by Stephen Shalovitz, who is my very, very dear friend. And uh, it's episode number 102, I believe. And then you've done another episode with him quite recently that will come out. One Way Ticket Show by Stephen Shalovitz is incredible. Uh, I was on it as well, one of the first ones he interviewed. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's, uh, he, it's, it's a fascinating program. You, uh, all of you can listen to it on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a podcast, but you can listen it, uh, to it through, through any kind of a platform, Spotify, and uh, Instagram and Facebook, and I will be happy to uh, tell uh, a little bit more um, about it uh, to anyone who will ask me. But thank you, Stephen, for doing this. So I know that uh, Prince Dimitri, you had a very nice interview with Stephen, uh, and I enjoyed great. it myself thoroughly. It was great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I can see Stephen wrote a comment. Hello, Stephen, <laughs> <laughs> listening to us. I wanted to just say something. I saw a comment before when we were... Uh, somebody didn't hear the title of the book. It's Once Upon a Diamond. Once Upon a Diamond. Yes, Not and I will put it on my story later on. I will make sure that uh, uh, yeah. uh, everybody knows and uh, that it's published by Soli. And uh, we will yes. make sure that uh, we'll get it here at one point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well... Is there anything else that you would like to share in particular with, uh, with all of us that uh, I, we haven't spoken about and uh, just uh, what you would like to perhaps give us a personal message and, uh, or as a lesson? I'm, I'm totally overwhelmed about the stories of your family and how humble yeah. and how stoic and heroic and uh, kind they have been. And uh, it's such a privilege to talk to you and you know as they say apple doesn't come far from the apple tree so this is exactly what Thank we you. see right now it's very funny stories you know there's not only serious ones there, there are a few in the book you see can you yeah. tell us one funny story just to, to leave it on a on I a light aside one funny story of my grandmother that's not in the book so I, you can I, I, I won't say what's in the book I'll, but my my grandmother princess olga when we were uh, young growing up. I'll, I'll never forget uh, her beautiful tiaras were, were in the vault of the bank in Paris. So one day she said, you know, I have to go to the bank. You have to come with me. So I went there. It was in Place Vendôme. And she, but first we have to go to the market. And she went to the market and she bought one big salad and put it in a brown bag. And I said, what are you doing? What are you... <laughs> Why? What's... She said, you'll see, you'll see. Oh, and, um, and some leeks also. 
So we go to the, the bank, we get uh, the tiara. She puts the tiara in the bottom of the bag with the salad and the leeks on top. And she oh says, my God. There we go. Now we're going to walk back home and uh, we can take the bath. <laughs> It's such fun to take the bus, and nobody's going to know I have a tiara, and nobody will even think of attacking us. <laughs> it's extremely clever. That's, yes, very funny like that. And we did a while. We took a bus, and then she was looking around and she was winking at me. <laughs> Say, if only they knew. Exactly. <laughs> that was... Well, I'm glad they didn't. But it's it's very um, very smart, very clever, and it's very funny indeed. We always did things like that to keep us amused, the children. Because, you know, when we were very little, she would wake us up in the middle of the night, of what feels feel like middle of the night, was 10 o'clock, and we would go to her bal balcony with binoculars, and we were allowed to watch the, the full moon. I mean, we knew about it, so we were all excited, but we could watch the full moon, and it was the memory that stayed for the rest of the summer. We always thought we could see, you know, the, uh, uh, UFOs and things, and we would speak about oh, it. For the it's summer. imagination, and it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yeah, so she was great like that. Fantastic, and I know that you have a, that your mother gave birth to two pairs of twins. Two pairs of twins. Yes. That's incredible. Yes. <laughs> so she was very proud of it, and then some and, until someone saw her, showed her a, a magazine in Italy where there was the story of a lady in Naples who had uh, three pairs of of twins. Yes. So competition. Oh. More or less at the same time, in the same month as my last, uh, my younger brother and sister, yeah. And you're very close still with your mother, I understand, and that she is a deconspiration, yeah. has been obviously a very deconspiration to you, and this is... Yes, but she's very, very spiritual, and she, she and I still today, we exchange, you know, views on... Uh, spiritual views on you know is current events and she's always with a good book uh, I'm always with a good book so we exchange books all the time so it's a very interesting uh, relationship yeah, yeah that's wonderful that's really really very heartwarming what are you reading these days I'm reading a, a book for the third time actually called uh, the power of now the by, power of now okay the power of now by this German philosopher called Eckhart Tolle and um it's really Buddhist philosophy uh, rewritten for uh, the Western mind, but also in the form of a book of techniques uh, um, and um, insights into the psychological mind of, uh, and the construction of the personality um, of people. And it's absolutely fantastic. He has fantastic. a yes. It's, it makes you grounded. I, I, I know this book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I, know, I know this book. It's fascinating. It's a wonderful book. Yes. Yeah. And he has a website with meditations on it. And I do them twice a day. And it's, it's saved my life. That's great. I keep and on giving it to all my friends. And all my friends have been very uh, happy to read it always. Yeah, I can see yes, a Hi, Meli. <laughs> Especially now, I think we all need to yes. know how, the power of now and to be able to live yes. at present and uh, embrace today. So that I think this is very, very important. Yeah. What music do you like to listen to? I love classical music. Most yeah. of them. Who does? Me too. Yeah, I my, my, my passion. two favorites are Bach and, uh, and Mozart and also Beethoven, I would say, the, the three favorites. And then... Okay. We, I have also a soft spot for Italian opera. That is... And what is your favorite opera? I have three. I would say ex -eco. I would say Norma, Trovatore, and Don Giovanni. Okay. There's okay. also uh, Lucia di Lammermoor, which I like. <laughs> it's very difficult. That's, the, the, that's, that's kind of doesn't really fit into the trio of the other ones, but okay. No, no. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I love those two as well, and I love Aida. It's one of my favorite as well. Oh, and I mean, all, all of Verdi, I love yeah. them. Well, that's wonderful. My boss kids play uh, piano, and so that I, and I grew up with classical music as well, as you know, so that's uh, definitely, yeah. I don't believe that the life really exists to the fullest if you don't appreciate, if you don't listen to classical music. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But you're speaking like a true Russian, and me and with... I, well, you know... <laughs> understands you very well like that. But you know, as, as, you, as sure. you know, I'm sure, in, in yeah. Russia, former Soviet Union, education and culture, cultural education especially yeah. was non-negotiable. So that's something that I... It's just, fun. It's a part of, a part of all my life, part of our yeah. 
heritage, yes. I think it's fundamental to teach uh, culture uh, to people. And unfortunately, one doesn't enough these days. I, I totally agree. So I'm yeah. actually in Singapore trying to, from, from whatever I can do actually to, to promote and to support the art and culture and the, the involved right. in the theater and the classical music and everything. I think this is detrimental part of everybody's life. It's, especially it's when, when, especially in situations like that, because this is a this is enhancement of uh, uh, everyday's life. Yeah, you know, there's a French poet called Christian Babin who said, um, "Through music, God penetrates the air." Oh, I love this quote. Through music, God penetrates the air. We this is beautiful. Penetre l'air in French, yeah, and it's true. You know. After a day of listening to beautiful classical music, it changes the energy of a room. Absolutely, hundred percent. And that's and I can listen to classical music all the time. I, I don't need to be uh, asked what choice of a music I would like to have. I think this is just. I don't want to say it as a defo default, but no. it's definitely something that is uh, the most uh, intense and yet the most soothing at the times. Yeah, yeah, that's why they use the Gregorian chants, you know, in churches, uh, in the old days and still today. And that's also something I, I listen to a lot is sometimes, is Gregorian. Well, it's great for meditation, I think, as well. Especially uh, Hildegard von Bingen. I don't know if, you've, uh, if you like her. She was a saint, Saint Hildegard, and she was the advisor of three popes in her days. And she, was, and she heard the, the voices of the angels. And she that's wrote, incredible. Down and it's um, it's sung also by women, not only by men like in normal Gregorian chants. Yeah, yeah. And there's certain pieces which are almost contemporary with uh, with drums and um, bells and things, but it's incredibly spiritual and high. And you listen to Hildegard von Bingen, and after a while, you'll see that your whole room, your whole vibration, your whole energy will will switch to a higher level. That's wonderful. I will talk to you separately later on, and you'll yes. I'll ask a few questions. I will ask you to send to send me the information. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, well, thank you so much, and I really, really, it's, I I think all of us been extremely fortunate thank to you. have you today with us, and uh, you are true inspiration and. Uh, uh, now we all, I believe, all of us understand that uh, how important uh, the heritage is. Of course, you have an incredible royal lineage, but uh, you, it, nevertheless, uh, besides being royal, uh, in the full sense of a word, your family gave you an incredible kindness. And uh, Thank you. I'm very grateful I'm, for being I work on it every day because sometimes I can get angry. It's something you have to work at it. It's oh, yes, absolutely. But yes, you yeah. have to cultivate it and you have to just walk within your own self, with your own soul. But thank you so much, Prince Dmitry. Thank you. Really. Thank you. And have a very nice uh, day uh, ahead. I will be uh, recording. This program has been recorded, so I will send you the link. And oh. please feel free to share. And uh, we all will... I. Will be more than happy for my own self to listen it again, and I will post it for everyone who was not able to join us today. Thank you, thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs> Great. And Bye. more to come. Bye bye. 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 bye.